This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. CHAPTER I. OUTSIDE QUARANTINE. The gray horse stopped by a post on the other side of the road from the little wooden station, as if he knew what was expected of him, and a young girl got out of the carriage and fastened him with a strap. The horse bowed his head two or three times as if to let her know the hitching was unnecessary, but he would overlook it this time, seeing it was she who had done it. The girl's fingers did their work with accustomed skill, but the horse saw that she was preoccupied, and she turned from him toward the station a trifle reluctantly. There was a grave pucker between her eyebrows that showed her present duty was not one of choice. She walked deliberately into the little waiting room occupied by some women and noisy children, and compared her watch with the grim-faced clock behind the agent's grating. She asked in a clear voice if the 555 New York train was on time, and being assured that it was, she went out to the platform to look up the long stretch of track gleaming in the late afternoon sun, and to wait. Five miles away, speeding toward the same station, another girl of about the same age sat in a chair car, impatiently watching the houses, trees, and telegraph poles as they flew by. She had gathered her possessions about her preparatory to leaving the train, and had been duly brushed by the obsequious colored porter, who seemed to have her in charge, and she now wore an air of impatient submission to the inevitable. She was unmistakably city-bred and wealthy, from the crown of her elaborate black chiffon hat to the tip of her elegant boot. She looked with scorn on the rich farming country, with its plain, useful buildings and occasional pretty homes, through which she was being carried. It was evident, even to the casual onlooker, that this journey she was taking was hardly to her taste. She felt a wave of rebellion toward her father, now well on his way to another continent, for having insisted upon immuring her in a small backcountry village with his maiden sister during his enforced absence. He might well enough have left her in New York with a suitable chaperone if he had only thought so, or taken her along though that would have been a bore, as he was too hurried with business to be able to give time and thought to making it pleasant for her. She threw her pretty forehead into a frown, as she thought the vexed question over again, and contemplated with dread the six stupid weeks before she could hope for his return and her release from exile. She pouted her lips in annoyance, as she thought of a certain young man who was to be in New York during the winter, she was to have met him at a dinner this very night. She wondered for the hundredth time if it could possibly be that Papa had heard of her friendship with this gay young fellow, and because of it had hustled her off to Hillcroft so unceremoniously. Her cheeks burned at the thought, and she bit her lips angrily. Papa was so particular. Men did not know how to bring up a girl anyway. If only her mother had lived, she felt sure she would not have had such old-fashioned notions, for her mother had been quite a gay woman of fashion, from what people in society said of her. There was nothing the matter with this Mr. Worthington, either. A little fast, but it had not hurt him. He was delightful company. Fathers ought to know that their daughters enjoyed men with some spirit, and not namby-pamby milk-and-water creatures. Probably Papa had been gay in his youth also, she had heard it said that all men were, in which case he ought to be lenient toward other young men, and not expect them to be grave and solemn before their time. Mr. Worthington dressed perfectly, and that was a good deal. She liked to see a man well dressed. Papa was certainly very foolish about her. With this filial reflection, the young woman arose as the train came to a halt, and followed the porter from the car. Several passengers alighted, but the girl on the platform knew instinctively that the young woman in the elegant gray broadcloth skirt and dainty shirtwaist, carrying on her arm her gray coat, which showed more than a gleam of the turquoise blue silk lining, and unconcernedly trailing her long skirt on the dirty platform, was the one with whom she had to do. 
Allison Gray waited just the least perceptible second before she stepped forward. She told herself afterward that it made it so much worse to have that shining black porter standing smiling and bowing to listen. She felt that her duty was fully as disagreeable as she had feared. Yet she was one who usually faced duty cheerfully. She could not help glancing down at her own blue serge skirt and plain white shirt waist, and remembering that her hands were guiltless of gloves, as she walked forward to where the other girl stood. "Is this Miss Rutherford?" she asked, trying to keep her voice from trembling, and hoping her mental perturbation was not visible. The traveler wheeled with a graceful turn of her tall figure that left the tailor made skirt in lovely curved lines, which Allison with her artist's eye noted at once, and stared. Evelyn Rutherford's eyes were black and had an expression which in a less refined type of girl would have been called saucy. In her it was modified into haughtiness. She looked Allison Gray over, and it seemed to Allison that she took account of every discrepancy in her plain little toilet before she answered. It is. There was that in the tone of the answer that said, And what business of yours may that be, pray? Allison's cheeks flushed, and there came a sparkle in her eye that spoke of other feelings than her quiet answer betokened. Then will you come this way, please? The carriage is on the other side of the station. Your aunt, Miss Rutherford, was unable to meet you, and I have come in her place. If you will give me your check, I will see that your baggage is attended to at once. Indeed, said the bewildered traveler, and she followed the other girl with an air of injured dignity. Was this some kind of a superior servant her aunt had sent to take her place? Her maid, perhaps? She certainly did not speak or act like a servant, and yet, then her indignation waxed great. To think that her father's sister should treat her in this way, not even come to the station to meet her when she was an entire stranger, and had never even seen her since she was three years old. In New York, of course, she would not have expected it. Things were different, but she had always understood that country people made a great deal of meeting their friends at the station. Her aunt had spoken of this in her letter, a fine welcome, to be sure. She could not be ill, or this person would have mentioned it at once. She entirely forgot that a few moments before, one of her greatest grievances had been that she feared her aunt would bore her with a show of affection, for she remembered the many caresses of her babyhood indistinctly, and her nature was not one that cared for feminine affection overmuch. Allison showed the colored porter where to deposit the bags and umbrellas on the station platform, and taking the checks given her left the elegant stranger standing amid her belongings, looking with disdain at the pony phaeton across the road, and wondering where the carriage could be. She was growing angry at being left standing so long when she became aware that the girl across the road untying the pony was the same one who had gone away with her checks and it began to dawn upon her that she was expected to get into that small conveyance with this other girl. She submitted with what grace she could, as there seemed to be nothing else to be done, but the expression on her face was anything but pleasant, and she demanded an explanation of the state of things in no sweet manner. What is the meaning of all this? Is this my aunt's carriage? Where is her driver? She asked imperiously. Having made up her mind that this girl was a servant, she concluded to treat her accordingly. It was characteristic of Allison that she waited until she had carefully spread the clean linen robe over the gray broadcloth skirt, gathered her reins deliberately, and given the pony word to go before she answered. Even then she did not speak until the phaeton was turned around and they were fairly started, spinning over the smooth road under the arching trees. By that time her voice was sweet and steady, and her temper was well under her control. I am very sorry, Miss Rutherford, that you should suffer any inconvenience, she said. It is certainly not so pleasant for you as if your aunt had been able to meet you as she planned. No, this is not her carriage. It belongs to us, and we are her neighbors and dear friends. She forced herself to say this with a pleasant smile 
although she felt, somehow, as if this girl beside her would resent it. "Really?" interpolated Miss Rutherford, as one who awaits a much needed explanation. "Yes, your aunt was expecting you looking forward with great pleasure to your coming, she bade me say," went on Allison, reciting her lesson a trifle stiffly. "And only two hours ago she discovered serious illness among her household, which they are afraid may be contagious they cannot tell for some hours yet. She does not wish you to come to the house until they are sure. She hopes that it will be all right for you to come home by to morrow, or the next day at most. And in the meantime we will try to make you as comfortable as possible. Your aunt sent us word by the doctor this morning, asking me to meet you, and explain why it would not be safe for her to meet you. I am Allison Gray. We live quite at the other end of town from Miss Rutherford, so you will be entirely safe from any infection should it prove to be serious. Miss Rutherford was kind enough to think my mother could make you a little more comfortable than anyone else." Allison was almost in her usual spirits as she finished speaking. It would not be so bad after the stranger understood, surely. She did not add what Miss Rutherford had said about having her niece with herself, Allison, as she hoped another girl's company would make her feel less lonely and strange. For Allison saw at once that this was not a girl who cared for other girls' company a straw, at least not such as she. Evelyn Rutherford's face was a study. Chagrin and astonishment struggled for the mastery. I do not understand, she said. Who is ill in the family that could prevent my aunt meeting me? I thought she lived alone. She does, said Allison quickly, except for her two servants. It is one of them, the cook. She has been with Miss Rutherford for fifteen years, you know, and is almost like her own flesh and blood to her. Besides, she has taken care of her all night herself. Before she knew there was any need for caution, and if it is smallpox, as they fear, she has been fully exposed to it already, so it would not be safe for her to come to you until they are sure. Horrors! exclaimed the stranger, and Allison saw that her face turned a deadly white. Stop, turn around, I will go right back to New York. You need not feel afraid, said Allison gently. There is none of it in town, and this case is entirely isolated. The woman has been away on a visit to her brother, and probably took the disease there. She came home only yesterday. She came back sooner than she intended, because you were coming and Miss Rutherford sent for her. There is really no cause for alarm, for the utmost care will be taken if it should prove to be smallpox, and by morning we may hear that it is all all right and she is getting well, and it is not that at all. Besides, there is no New York train going out tonight. The last one passed yours about ten miles back. You will have to stay until tomorrow, anyway. Mercy, said the stranger, seeming not to be able to find words to express her feelings. She was certainly taking the news very badly, but her hostess hoped she would behave better when she was fully possessed of the facts. Miss Rutherford asked a few more questions about her aunt, commenting scornfully upon her devotion to a servant, which brought an angry flush into the other girl's cheek, and then settled down to the inevitable. Upon reflection, she decided it would be better to wait and write or telegraph to her friends in New York before returning to them. Indeed, there was no one in town just then, for it was early for people to return to the city, with whom she felt sufficiently intimate to drop down upon them unannounced for a prolonged visit, and she knew that her father would utterly disapprove of her being with any of them anyway. Do your people keep a boarding house? she asked turning curious eyes on Allison, who flushed again under the tone, which sounded to her insolent, but waited until she had disentangled the reins from the pony's tail before she replied gently, No. Well, but I don't understand, said the guest. Did you not say that my aunt had arranged for me to board with you? A bright spot came in each of Allison's cheeks ere she replied with gentle dignity, no, you are to visit us, if you will. Your aunt is a dear friend of my mother, Miss Rutherford. She resolved in her heart that she would never, never call this girl Evelyn, 
she did not want the intimate friendship that her old friend had hinted at in telling her first of the coming of the city niece. Allison was favored with another disagreeable stare, but she gave her attention to the pony. "Really, I'm obliged," said the guest, in icy tones that made Allison feel as if she had been guilty of unpardonable impertinence in inviting her. "Was there no hotel or private boarding house to which I could have gone? I dislike to be under obligations to entire strangers." Allison's tones were as icily dignified now as her unwilling guest's as she replied, "Certainly, there are two hotels and there is a boarding house." "You would hardly care to stay in the boarding house, I fancy. It has not the reputation of being very clean. I can take you to either of the hotels if you wish, but even in Hilcroft it would scarcely be the thing for a young girl to stay alone at one of them. We sometimes hear of chaperons even as far west as this, Miss Rutherford." Allison's eyes were bright as she drew herself up straight in the carriage as she said this, but she remembered almost immediately the pained look that would have come into her mother's eyes if she had heard this exhibition of something besides a meek and quiet spirit and she tried to control herself. Yet in spite of the way in which she had spoken, her words had some effect on the young woman by her side. She had been met by the enemy on her own ground and vanquished. She had a faint idea that her brother Dick would have remarked something about being hoist with his own petard, had he been by, for she was wont to be particular about these things at home. She felt thankful that he was several hundreds of miles away, she said no more about hotels. She understood the matter of chaperonage even better than did Allison Gray, and strange as it may seem, Allison rose in her estimation several degrees after her haughty speech. There was silence in the phaeton for some minutes. Then the driver spoke to point out a dingy house close to the street, with several dingy children playing about the steps. There was a sign in one window on a fly-specked card, rooms to rent, and a card hung out on a stick nailed to the door frame. Vegetable soup today. This is the boarding house, said Allison. Do you wish me to leave you here? Her spirit was not quite subdued yet. Evelyn Rutherford looked and uttered an exclamation of horror. Her companion caught the expression, and a spirit of fun took the place of her look of indignation. In spite of herself, she laughed but the girl beside her was too much used to having her own way to relish any such joke as this. She maintained an offended silence. They passed the two hotels of the town, facing one another on Post Office Square. There were loungers smoking on the steps, and on the long piazzas of both, and at the open door of one, a dashing young woman, with a loud laugh and louder attire, joked openly with a crowd of men, and seemed to be proud of her position among them. Evelyn curled her lip, and shrank into the carriage farther at thought of herself as a guest at that house. I fear I shall have to trouble you, at least until I can communicate with my aunt or make other arrangements. She said stiffly, and added condescendingly, I'm sure I'm much obliged. Then the carriage turned in at a flower-bordered driveway with glimpses of a pretty lawn beyond the fringe of crimson blossoms, and Miss Rutherford realized that her journey was at an end. End of chapter 1
she said, as she waited for the stranger to step from the carriage. And Evelyn noticed that she placed her arm around her daughter and put an unobtrusive kiss on the pink cheek. "This is mother," Allison said, all the sharpness gone out of her voice. That Mrs. Gray should fold her in her arms and place a kiss, tender and loving, upon her cheek was an utter astonishment to Evelyn Rutherford. She was not used to being kissed. Her own mother had long been gone from her, and the women in whose charge she had been had not felt inclined to kiss her. In fact, she disliked any show of affection, especially between two women, and would have been disposed to resent this kiss had it been given by one less sweet and sincere. But one could not resent Mrs. Gray, even if that one were Evelyn Rutherford. "My dear, I am so sorry for you," was what she said next. "It must be very hard for your journey to end among strangers, after all. But you need not be anxious about your dear aunt. She is so strong and well, and has often nursed contagious diseases without contracting anything." Allison, as she went down the steps to take the pony to his stable, could not help waiting just the least little bit to hear what this strange girl would say.